We are looking at an article uh, titled The Solar Boat at Nauf, County Meath, by Eamon P. Ned Kelly. I did a little intro in a previous clip, a much longer intro than expected. Didn't even get into reading the article properly. Um, I was able to magnify the article, which wasn't as big as this in the previous clip. Um, and we're just going to start reading what uh, Mr. Kelly has to say about what he identifies as a solar boat carving at uh, Nauf on uh, one of the curbstones. Um, so, uh, at a bend in the River Boyne, uh, 50 kilometers uh, north of Dublin in the county of Meath, there are three large mounds. There are Newgrange, Nauf, and Douth. There are also being a series of smaller satellite mounds. Uh, these well-known monuments, which were built some 5,000 years ago by late Stone Age farmers, are situated in an archaeological landscape of exceptional importance, reflected in the fact that the area is a World Heritage Site. Each of the great mounds contains passages constructed of large stones that lead to internal chambers. Debate continues as to whether these monuments were built primarily as burial mounds, sacred temples, or astronomical observatories. It is feasible that perhaps they acted as a combination of all three of these functions. The large curbstones that surround the mounds and the stones of the passages and chambers within are decorated with motifs such as spirals, concentric circles, triangles, zigzags, lozenges, waved lines, and crescents. Although interpretations of these images vary, most commentators are inclined towards a view that the motifs are related to heavenly bodies such as the sun, the moon, and star constellations. Thus, the builders of these great monuments may have worshipped the sun and other heavenly bodies. This possibility appears to be supported by the famous midwinter sunrise event at Newgrange, where the rising sun at the solstice shines down the passage too. Uh, so we're going to end that there, and we'll come back to what he was saying. It is feasible that perhaps they acted as a combination of all three of these functions, specifically burial, tombs, sacred temples, or astronomical observatories. And I very much agree with Mr. Kelly on that point. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, that is what they are. They are not just burial mounds. They are not just sacred temples, and they are not just astronomical observatories. They actually do combine all three of these functions and possibly one or two others. Uh, but, but those, I would say, would be the th three main uh, functions. And I would even say that there, there are much more sacred temples uh, to the sun and the moon and, you know, perhaps other astronomical bodies, but primarily temples of the sun and, uh, and moon. Uh, uh, and then they do have astronomical uh, observation uh, alignments built into them in the passages. Uh, uh, Newgrange, as is mentioned, uh, has a passage aligned with the winter solstice sunrise. Douth has a passage aligned with the winter solstice sunset. And Nauth has passages, uh, well, for sure one anyway, aligned with the um, uh, equinox. So both the vernal and autumnal equinox sunrises uh, align with one of the passages in now. I will add that low crew, excuse me, La crew, uh, further west also has um, equinox alignments, and and, and uh, at La crew, uh, there's an equinox stone that gets lit up when the uh, sun rise the, the light from the sunrise enters the chamber and on the equinox stone there are two or three fairly simple raid sun symbols uh 
two or three flower-like symbols that I interpret as as artistic uh, impressions of the flower-like appearance of a total solar eclipse. There's a cross with a central disk, which I interpret as a solar cross inspired by a total solar eclipse. Um, there is what might be a solar boat. Um, there's an upturned crescent uh, with uh, three vertical lines in it. Uh, and then there's also, I believe, just some upturned crescents. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. There's, there's some other uh, carvings, um, but they're not obviously uh, the sun or the moon. Uh, they might actually be mathematical uh, carvings, you know, time counts, day counts, and, and so on. But but the point I'm making is is that when the sun lights up the equinox stone, it, it basically lights up artwork that depicts uh, rayed sun symbols, uh, depictions of a, a total eclipse of the sun. And there was at least one total solar eclipse above the Boyne Valley in the late Stone Age, uh, believe it was 3088 uh, BCE, which is actually a little after, I believe, these uh, tombs were built. Uh, I shouldn't say tombs because, uh, again, that, that's just one function and not even the primary function in my uh, mind. Uh, passage mounds is, I think, a much better term. Uh, and I'll try to use that. I've just got passage tombs hammered into my head over the last several years. Um, so that's the point I want to make. And, and so getting back to Nauth, uh, inside Nauth, which has a passage aligned with the equinox sunrises, there's a basin. And on that basin, on the outer perimeter, there's essentially a symbol, which in my interpretation of it consists of... Uh, three concentric circles representing the sun and then an upturned large lunar crescent embracing that solar disk uh the the concentric circles are representing the sun so so it's it's basically being cradled embraced by an upturned lunar crescent and this is a very common sun moon conjunction symbol that other cultures use to indicate the uh, coming together of the sun and the moon in a solar eclipse. Um, there's also a, a very simple rayed sun symbol inside the bowl uh, that I interpret as, as a winged sun type symbol. So it seems that there was a winged sun type eclipse. So let's keep going down here. That's uh, an image of uh, the main, uh, the main uh, mound, uh, Nauth, here. And then you got the satellite mounds around it. And there's the River Boyne in the, the background. So you can get an idea of what Nauth looks like. Um, so let's keep going. So yeah, so we're getting back to Newgrange, the, whoops, uh, the summer, uh, sorry, the winter solstice sunrise illuminates the terminal chamber. The symbolism of this event was of central importance because winter, sorry, midwinter's day saw the death of the old sun, by now weak and enfeebled, and the birth of a new vigorous sun that continued to grow in strength until midsummer's day. This is actually very important because uh, I have not read this before uh, from Mr. Kelly or anyone else to the best of my knowledge, yet I have been saying this for quite some time now because what i have been saying is is that ancient people and not just the ancient irish but the egyptians uh, uh south american cultures uh, the nazca and so on they transposed religious beliefs that were inspired by witnessing the very dramatic death and rebirth of the sun in a total solar eclipse, they transposed beliefs that were inspired by this event onto the winter solstice, sunset and sunrise, because total ecl solar eclipses are quite rare. Uh, you can have uh, two or three in one place in a comparatively short time frame, uh, but then you can wait centuries and, until another one comes along, or even uh, more than a millennia. Uh, and what my research finds is that in certain cultures, you know, they had like essentially two or three total solar eclipses occur above 
you know, where they were located in, a, let's say, within 20 years. Uh, and sometimes, uh, let's say, two eclipses within just a few years, and, and then another one, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years after that. And, and so three total solar eclipses within a short time frame, not to mention annular eclipses as well, uh, par strong partial eclipses and so on. But, but two or three total solar eclipses within a time span of, let's say, 20 years. Um, that apparently did not happen at, at uh, uh, the Boyne Valley, at least not in uh, the late 4th millennium. Uh, I think it, earlier in the 4th millennium, there was a couple of total solar eclipses quite close together. Um, but, but there is this total solar eclipse that took place in 3088 uh, BCE. Uh, there were some annual eclipses around the same time. Um, and, of course, there were later eclipses. Um, but in terms of influencing the, the art, uh, you know, it would have to be, you know, 3100 and earlier kind of thing. Um, so, essentially what Mr. Kelly is saying here could apply very well to a total solar eclipse. And, and as I said, I see clear evidence uh, of uh, ancient cultures transposing ideas inspired by total solar eclipses onto the winter solstice sunset and the winter solstice sunrise. And then actually part of that evidence is, is the Stone of the Seven Suns at Douth, which has four raid sun symbols that that are basically scientifically accurate depictions of a total solar eclipse uh, and then there's three cruder simpler raid sun symbols but four of them compare very very well to 19th century scientific astronomical drawings of a total solar eclipse uh, almost identical um uh, and that's you know when i saw this in the mid 90s i immediately realized that that this is what was depicted on the Stone of the Seven Suns. It's, it's total solar eclipses, and they represent not just the sun, not just the totally eclipsed sun, not just the death and rebirth of the sun, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, they also represent the, you know, eye-like appearance of a total solar eclipse. So they're, com they're basically uh, not just solar symbols, but, but sort of eye of God symbols, if you want to use that term and yes douth has a passage that's aligned with the winter solstice sunset the death of the sun the annual death of the sun so so you have this winter solstice sunset alignment uh associated with uh rock art that depicts a total solar eclipse you know do the math on that it's pretty straightforward then you have newgrange a little bit to the west and, and south which has the winter solstice sunrise alignment and and so in my opinion i think douth was dedicated to the death of the sun the annual death of the sun uh, in the winter solstice sunset uh, and newgrange was dedicated to the rebirth of the sun and i suspect that there were probably rituals that took place you know during and after the winter solstice sunset at douth and then during the longest night of the year a procession would be made uh, to newgrange to the west um, and they would hope for seeing the rising uh, newborn sun uh, shining into the uh, winter solstice uh, sunrise aligned uh, passage at Newgrange. Um, uh, that's I think a very reasonable, uh, a very reasonable uh, conjecture to make. Um, so uh, let's try to get back to Nauth here. Um, the evidence for the existence of solar worship across prehistoric Europe is abundant and vestiges survive in early Irish mythology where the sun god was known by a variety of names. This reflected the fact that the sun died each midwinter to be replaced by a new sun. One of the sun god's many names was Aed. I don't know how to pronounce that exactly, but A-E-D, meaning fire. Another was Eakid Alater. Again, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. The name Eakid derives from the old Irish word ek, meaning a horse. 
the significance being that of a divine horse that draws the sun across the heavens. Olater means great father, showing that the sun was also regarded as an ancestor deity. This is actually new information to me. Like I, I did not know this prior to reading this article, and, and I only read this article in the last week or so. So this is new information to me, um, and it is, it is, of course, of interest. And we can say a thing or two about the sun and horses, uh, but for the time being, we won't. We're, we're basically probably going to end up doing a third clip here. Um, these Irish beliefs formed part of a wider European religious tradition that is illustrated by a remarkable object dating to around 440, uh, sorry, 1400 BC, found in a bog called Trundholm Moes in Denmark. The object is a model of the sun drawn by a divine horse. The representations of the sun and the horse have been placed on wheels to symbolize the motion of the sun on its diurnal journey. One surface of the sun disk is covered by a gold sheet to represent the daytime sun. As one looks on the golden face of the sun disk, the model is seen to be moving from left to right in conformity with the movement of the sun across the daytime sky from dawn to sunset. The sun descended at sunset into the underworld from which it emerged next morning to illuminate a new day. The darker bronze face of the Trundholm Mos sun disk represents the sun on its nightly passage through the underworld, where it travels in the opposite direction from right to left, moving from sunset to sunrise. Okay, again, that is quite new to me. Um, and what I would suggest is that the darker obverse of the symbol may possibly you know also represent the dark disk of the sun during a total solar eclipse you know the death of the sun you know the sun dies during totality and the sun dies and it's uh, reborn you know uh, during the night um so i think that's a possibility okay we see that the other side there yeah um so I will go into that later, and of course there's the Uffington White Horse, which comes to mind, geoglyph in England, Oxfordshire, um, which is only visible from the sky, by the way, uh, so do the math on that. Um, anyway, how much time do we have left? Uh, yeah, just less than two minutes, oh dear. Um, looks like we're going to do a third clip. So, a complementary belief was that the sun was born on its journey by a solar boat. And Bronze Age rock carvings in southern Sweden show representations of both the solar horse chariot and the solar boat. Representations of the solar boat occur elsewhere and are a frequent theme in Iron Age uh, Latin Celtic art in Ireland. A bronze disc from Monasterevin, County Kildare, shows a large image of the solar boat in the daytime sky with a smaller image below representing the sun in the underworld, figure six. In the larger uh, of the two motifs, let's see if I can scroll down here without going too far. All right, uh, let's see what the time is. Yeah, I have just over a minute. So, um, yeah, where where it shows a large image of the sun boat of the solar boat in the daytime sky with a smaller image below representing the sun in the underworld, figure six. In the large of the two motifs, the stem and stern of the crescent shaped boat each end in spirals which terminate in bird heads. The birds excuse me. The birds have bossed eyes and each has a long neck and a long pointed beak. In what appears to be a protective gesture, the bird heads flank an open ring that represents the daytime sun. The bird heads are not present on the smaller image of the solar boat on which the sun appears as a closed boss representing the darkened sun in the underworld. Representations of birds associated with the solar boat in Iron Age Ireland reflect aspects of ancient Egyptian tradition. 
And yeah, we just got a few seconds left, so it looks like we're going into another clip here.